everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 546. Today, uh, Wednesday, the 22nd of August, 2018 of your Earth years. Uh, if you're watching this via YouTube and you haven't subscribed yet, thoroughly recommend you do, because every time we post a new video, which is quite often, and also we do this show weekly, uh, you'll be notified and you can get to it straight away. Uh, watching, want to say hello to our live streamer, uh, people in the, ch uh, the YouTube chat, and also we've got our own chat room at sonicstate.com forward slash live, where we embed this and you can choose whichever one which chat room you feel more comfortable in that's fine this is the podcast dedicated to music technology synthesizers software drum machines uh, sampling djs live performance recording all the whole wide gamut of everything to do with making recording and performing music with a slight bend towards the electronic kind, but not exclusively. So uh, this week we've got a new guest, actually, and this is a, it's a great story, actually, because uh, we've got uh, Justin DeLay, who is from uh, Reverb.com. Fantastic name for a person who works in the music industry, I have to say, and it's authentic. We've seen his birth certificate. Uh, but Reverb, Reverb basically got in touch and said, we listened to the show and we'd love to come on. So that's what's basically going on here. So, Justin, how are you? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm... Uh... I'm excited to be here. Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a rare and special day when I get to hang out with my uh, with my synth brethren. Excellent. Well, it's lovely, <laughs> lovely to have you here. And so, Justin, what's your what's your official role? Because you've sort of Reverb's one of these companies where things change quite a lot. So I imagine you've had various different roles at Reverb. What are you currently? Uh, what's your current position? Yeah, yeah. So I've been with Reverb for a couple of years now, and uh, you know, the company overall is about uh, five years old. I originally joined to really start our um, our entry into the world of music software and production. Um, and based on the success we saw there, really grew into uh, leading our synthesizer and electronic instrument category. These days, I'm the director of new categories, which essentially means you know things beyond uh, guitars and stringed instruments. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a small company. We wear a lot of hats. Uh, uh, I run all, right, within the new categories. I, I lead our band and orchestra uh, category right, okay. as well. So kind of a mixed bag. But yeah, yeah I mean, a lot of your, you know, you're uh, into music technology yourself. You know, do you play synths yeah. and do you, is you've got your own kind of little collection there? Normally we have that, that would be behind you displayed as your sort of like pedigree, but I'm guessing you're at work, so you may not have them. Yeah, you. I'm, I'm I'm at work. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I've been playing for a long time. I started as a guitarist. Uh, I got really into pedals. And one day I was sitting in front of my pedal board, which was about as wide as a synthesizer and thought to myself, you know, the only thing that has more knobs than a pedal board is a synthesizer. So I might as well go and learn how to do that. Uh, so yeah, the past, you know, 10 years or so really been deep, deep, deep down the synth rabbit hole. Um, you know, personal collection I've had, I've owned just about everything, but I kind of, I, I, I find, I'll tell you, working at Reverb uh, is a dangerous thing if you're into yeah. buying synthesizers. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, but no, I, I, I had a big burst of, of buying activity and then sold off a bunch of stuff. And so I've, I've pretty much consolidated down to a Profit 5 that I've been working on for years, did the Wine Country MIDI mod on it, which is, uh, which is awesome. But, you know, it, Anytime you start modding the vintage stuff, you're running into all kinds of new issues. Mm. Uh, Juno 106 with the Kiwi mod, and then um, a Korg Monopoly and one of the Model D reissues are my my primary uh, sense of choice these days. Nice. Well, I, I'll, we'll come back to you and talk to you a bit more about that. Uh, we should introduce our other guests cool. as well. Uh, we've also got uh, Mr. Matthew Hodson, who is uh, there in his modular studio, modular performance live stream. You've got a new, uh, you've, you, you, you've been working on your backdrop. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah i thought i'd just have someone in there um what else is new in here uh out of sight actually i've gone a little bit old school just installed a mackie 32.8 bus and a oh, console prodigy style so got, yeah man cool. uh, yeah i've got that back in um for a long time i was just using a, an, an onyx it was a smaller desk but i've just I wanted to get a few more channels available, really, for, to do some more flexible routing things, more effects running. I use a lot of guitar effects pedals. So, um, yeah, that's gone in. I've had to cable that. I've had to get my old racks out, compressors are racked up, and a couple of new sound cards as well, which I've got working together, a PreSonus and a Focusrite. And, um, yeah, I've got them working together as an aggregate device inside ah, okay. the Mac. 
so it sees them as one so i can use the inputs for both sound cards simultaneously and they're clocked over adap um with no issues so uh yeah i haven't really been doing much music this week just, yeah just, tech uh, stuff I, I must yeah. remember, I, I used to have a Mackie 32 8, uh, and I remember because I came from, we had a Studio Master 16 8 studio, which was uh, the one okay. with the MIDI mutes. And I, yeah. for some reason, I, d I wanted the Mackie because it was the all the rage at the time. And I remember when I got it, I had a real problem because the EQ is has got a weird phase issue with it. So if you if okay. you're doing any EQ stuff, I mean, so only on so yeah. it's in the mids. And you start to do it and it start to me to my ears it sounded a bit off so it's fine for you know you smash the uh, my camps don't you that's one of the tricks in it you you could get yeah. that drive in it but the eq is uh, i couldn't couldn't work with it i ended up selling it and uh, get, going down the digital route but i just couldn't oh, get okay. on with that but uh, i don't think it because i thought my mixer was broken for ages but it, it wasn't it's just this weird phase issue that i just seemed hypersensitive to so i hope uh, maybe yours is a later yeah. revision where it was all fixed I'm going to certainly check that out. Um, you should, maybe I could use it more of a feature. <laughs> That's true. Is. Yeah. Uh, Stereo wi wi widening. Yeah. Stereo yeah, widening. Exactly. Well, yeah. uh, nice to see you, Matthew. Uh, we'll come back to you in a sec. We'll say hello to also Mr. Gaz Williams, who's there in Bristol, bass player, producer, music technologist. Uh, how are you, Gaz? Are you well? I'm very good. I was uh, just referred to as Daz by accident in the chat room there. And I was thinking, it reminded me of Daz, the washing powder company. Do you remember Daz? They used to advertise in the 1980s. Like yeah. they, they would make your whites, like a bluey white. Do you remember? Yeah. Like a, blue, like a bluey. And then people were like, we don't want our washing. We don't want our whites bluey white. We want our whites white. So, <laughs> yes. So they don't do that anymore. It Just was so. uh, it was some kind of fluoro uh, fluoro uh, pigment that they put in it so that the, it would bring out the blue light. I think if I seem to remember that, that's a right. totally random fact. I have no idea where I got that. But mm. Daz, is, Daz is short for Darren, not, <laughs> not uh, Gareth, isn't it? So Yes, I am a Gareth indeed. But yes, Gaz, yes. So, yes. Uh, a bit of a non sequitur start there, but very happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, you're most welcome. So uh, <laughs> I, I guess uh, we were going to start off because um, obviously, uh, um, um, oh, I'm coming oh, back. I'm to coming myself. back to myself. Where am I coming back from? That's weird. Uh, um, so. Uh, uh, what was I going to say? I've completely lost my thread of thought. Yes, I was going to ask you, uh, Justin, about um, essentially that, you know, working. It, 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 when I was a kid, they always used to have these kind of uh, like yard sales, jumble sales at schools. And if you were able to org to be part of the organising, you go in with your mum, you, you basically get the pick of the crop of all the bargains that were there before they opened the doors. I'm guessing, is <laughs> is that one of the the bonuses that you get for working at Reverb? Or do you, do you just get, you know, more advanced searches if you're looking for something specific yourself <laughs> yeah you know it, it's funny we we actually really don't get uh any kind of preferential treatment because it's a marketplace right so it's an open marketplace anybody can buy and sell you know as soon as as soon as somebody hops on and lists a, a synth for sale it's live for everyone you know we don't get like any kind of uh preview or sneak preview of it uh, so I'm draft in versions of ads like, posting yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm hustling just like everybody else, man. <laughs> right. So, uh, Justin, I mean, one of the things that uh, I was really interested in, you know, because I know um, last year, I think we posted something about this. And this was uh, that, that you do these kind of best selling synths and drum machines of 2007. Obviously, we're still in 2018. And this, this, I think this went out in December. Yeah, it was December the 4th last year. There were some interesting uh, highlights there. What, what, one of the things I'm, I'm interested in is kind of what are the trends? Because as commentators and posters of news, you know, we say this is maybe a really good piece of equipment. We just assume that it's selling by the bucket load. But are there, are there any kind of surprises as to what is uh, what's trended, what's hot right now? And maybe you used or, or secondhand. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple of um, high level insights into the market and then I'll, I'll dive into a couple of specific products. So one of the things I think is fascinating because uh, because we're a used gear marketplace, you know, we get to see really the entire history of the the synthesizer category. And so one of the ways I love to look at our, our marketplace is, is by decade. And uh, what you see actually in the synth category is as much as, you know, I think we all um, revere and, and dream about, you know, the really vintage original generation products, 
what we really see is that there's a there's a big spike in activity around the 1980s synthesizers not a big surprise uh and then there's a real dormance during the 90s again not a huge surprise and then a, a real majority of the the volume and the activity is really around products that have been made in the last 10 years and you know again i think for for you know the 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 hardcore synth folks uh you know like like us that might be a little bit surprising but you know i think the, really the majority of the market is primarily focused on products that you can that you can buy new right now even you know i mean really kind of modern current products and that's a little bit distinct from other categories uh you know if you look at electric guitar we see a much a much smoother distribution over time uh because i mean frankly you know a 1970s 1980s guitar is pretty much the same thing as a 2018 guitar you know i think in 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 the synthesizer category and electronic instrument category such a technology driven product you know that the products continue to evolve and it looks like for the for the mainstream buyer you know the, the today's models are really the best pick so along that and it's probably not a big surprise but the korg mini log is it just continues to be the most popular synthesizer and we see uh you know what's really interesting about that product is we see a lot of crossover from other buyers as well you know Korg mini log is usually the first synth that uh, a guitarist is going to buy or somebody uh who maybe was in the recording world and, and wants to add some new sounds to their studio uh you know the mini log and and i'm just to be perfectly clear like i have no relationship with Korg, I don't, you know, there's not, this is, we're just a marketplace, right? So I'm just reflecting what we see. It just seems like they really got the right combination of features, the right price point. Um, and it's just, it just does great business. Not surprising there. The one that surprises me, and I think this will be relevant for, for, for our audience here, the, the Teenage Engineering OP1 is just, is, is a really, really popular product on Reverb and, which is a little bit surprising, you know, given the price point there, um, yeah, I think and the, and, from, and the vocalness of the, of, of the critics, you know, how everyone's, oh, it's just oh, a hipster totally. toy, and, you know, totally. I mean, you know, there, there's, there are, you know, on paper, there are several, um, maybe strikes against it. Uh, but it just continues to, I mean, we can't, we can barely even keep them on the site. As soon as one list it's sold, uh, you know, within a couple of days, maybe a week. And I think, you know, from, from my perspective, I think that really speaks to, if you're if you're interested in synthesizers or you're interested in in electronic instruments if if you if you close your eyes and you picture a synthesizer as having black and white keys the the Korg mini log is just the the natural i think first purchase if if a keyboard instrument is is um is scary to you or you know you don't play keys and you you, you know you that that isn't an interface that is really welcoming to you I think what we see, you know, kind of this new generation of all-in-one groove boxes with the Volcas, the OP1, you know, I think that, that that actually becomes really inviting to a certain kind of buyer who says, I'm yeah. not playing keys anyway, so I don't really care. I just want to be able to push buttons. Um, and even though the OP1, you know, I think people, you know, they 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 write it off as a toy, but man, it is it is a powerful instrument. And Teenage Engineering as a company is just so you know, uh, supportive of the product and has just continued to, you know, to really make it more and more since its launch. Uh, and we see it hold its value really well on the used market because of that. Yeah, I know. I think that's true. I know, Gaz, you're a big fan of the OP1. What's something you said yeah. earlier there was really interesting to me, which mm. is you can chart the way that people almost you can chart their addiction to synthesizers by yeah you know, i started off i was just interested in guitar mm -hmm. pedals and now look and you can just see right i went uh called me log then i got maybe a, a, a semi-modular desktop and then i went whap right up into to modular stuff do you i mean i guess you know you don't necessarily get that kind of, you get more overview sort of type stuff rather than you know maybe delving down into kind of uh, uh the, the real uh, secret service level of, uh, of of personal data right yeah yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't track our users. We don't, uh, we, you know, we don't get weird about it. I, I really, I just look at it more in the aggregate. You know, I like to mm. better understand, um, you know, just broader trends. I didn't know, Gaz, did you know, did you know that they were, I thought that they were still in short demand. I didn't realize they were still making and selling loads of OP1s. Oh God, yeah. And the amount, mm. the amount of people I know who've bought them in recent times, uh, Oh gosh, yeah! What an incredible long for a music technology product. I mean, what is it? It's like nearly what's about seven years has it been on the market for now? Uh, and you know, mm -hmm. to maintain a price for that, and it was kind of 
on a technical level, quite underpowered when it first came out. I mean, I think it was like equivalent to a mobile phone from the mid noughties, I guess, or something like that. I mean, I'm not entirely sure, but, uh, you know, it hasn't received any upgrades like other products would need to, to sustain its, uh, its uh, lifespan. But um, Nick, I, is it all right if I just ask a question now? Yeah, of course, please and do. This is a slightly, this, this is a bit of a, it's kind of a warning. I've had a few people say to me that they've um, been ripped off on Gumtree in, in the UK now. I mean, I guess this is something, I think Gumtree may be elsewhere as well. But, um, and the thing is, why well, I wanted to bring this, I wanted to mention this anyway. So it's actually really handy having Justin here as well, just because I'm, I'm intrigued about what protection there is for uh the sale of things you know synthesizers especially you know really expensive items a lot of people wouldn't sell such you know really ex other than a car or a house or something but um uh so what's happened in the case that well a couple of examples i've heard recently is that people have, in, have entered into buying quite expensive products uh one i th i think maybe both of them, no, one was an Ovation Peak and the other one was um, an Electron Analog Rhythm. Now, these are two different people who've both um, come up to talk to me about this independently. So I'm anticipating that it might be something that's going on. But basically, they'd been duped uh, by the seller, uh, sent lots of pictures, uh, appeared to be very knowledgeable about the product. Um, I mean, uh, and then money sent no product arrive no further communication um gone um, and both people have said to me that they they, they were really it's really interesting how the, the two stories were very similar they were completely shocked by how authentic the seller seemed to be now i think mm. with music technology products um you need to know about them it's quite easy to maybe uh to to spot someone who's just kind of trying just to bluff winging it, it yeah so i it, yeah. i, I, I want I wanted to warn people about this just because I'd heard these two stories in quite quick succession, just thinking that this may be something that's going on and maybe other people have had similar experiences as well. So with that in mind, and I guess this is the question, is what does Reverb do in terms of uh, what, what has it got in place to try and give you know protection both ways? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And you know, just zooming out for a, a second, why reverb even exists you know I, I i can speak for myself and i think i can speak on behalf of you know the majority of our community we we really saw that ebay uh uh or craigslist if you're if you're buying locally you know those types of issues um could emerge you know where you've got sellers misrepresenting or or un, uneducated sellers uh misrepresenting products and you know, we just knew we could do better. And, and I think, you know, and it's not, it's not rocket science, but the company is, is built and managed every day by musicians, by gear lovers. And we really wanted to focus on the community aspect of, of this world that we're in. I mean, it's a small world, you know, there's, uh, it, it's a big market, but, but, you know, it, it tends to be a pretty, you know, a pretty close knit community. And we really wanted to push the community aspect and the reputation aspect of it really to the forefront. Um, so on that, you know, I mean, just kind of nuts and bolts, our largest uh, team here at Reverb, our, our customer experience team, uh, you know, the number one qualification is that you actually do know gear. And so if there's ever an issue and, and, you know, forget about even, um, uh, you know, sort of malicious behavior, but you know, sometimes stuff happens, right? Especially when you're, to your point, you know, you're shipping an expensive electronic piece of equipment. Um, sometimes things happen, you know, and it's nobody's fault. Uh, but we we really are very proactive uh, in stepping in. You know, if something's broken shipping, we'll we'll take it back. We'll get it fixed. You know, we'll 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 work with the buyer or the seller. Um, I mean, I can say just personally, I I can't stand broken gear. It just breaks my heart. So I'm usually, you know digging around in the basement looking for stuff that needs to be fixed because it, you know I, I we we really care about that and it's easy to say and you know the proof is in the pudding but you know more nuts and bolts we offer shipping protection we offer buyer and seller protection and uh you know we we really enforce a, a pretty a pretty high bar for our buyer and seller community uh you know folks folks aren't really given the opportunity to 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 make a bad faith transaction and uh, you know and i i don't i don't know exactly the the rates but i can tell you that it's a very very small 
percentage, both domestically as well as internationally, where there's ever some sort of conflict or something that needs a resolution. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately, I, I don't, you know, reverb's not perfect, and, and I'd be the first to admit it. And I think there's a lot that we can do to, to, to build our, our, our brand and our, and our authority. But I think it ultimately just comes down to, you know, we are able to say, hey, if I was in this situation, if I was the buyer, if I was the seller, what would I want to happen as someone who's bought thousands and thousands of dollars worth of music gear. And that really just guides the, the way that we deal with these issues moving forward. You know, we just try to do the right thing for both the, the, the people involved as well as frankly for the gear involved as well. And I think that that, that level of concern is, is a little bit different than you might see in more general purpose mm -hmm. marketplaces or, or, or storefronts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. That's I, I wanted to, sorry. I wanted to flag it though, because it seems like it's we've got uh, 100%. to, you know, so I was just interested to see if that, you know, um, so, I mean, in terms of like a malicious, someone trying to, I don't know, uh, there's good protection in place then, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, sort of totally. Like, I mean, we just, just to add a little color, we have a whole team, uh, a quality team that looks at every listing that comes on, um, not to get a, not to get a sneak peek at the deal, oh, but, yeah. to, but to verify the, 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. the authenticity uh, right. or the correctness of the listing uh, and, and we're really proactive even I mean even small things like hey you know we think this is going to sell better if you have better pictures uh, mm -hmm. you know we really try to be helpful in that way and flag mm -hmm. anything that looks even remotely suspicious so just one more, one more one more question sorry if you don't mind I was just about to list something for the first time I mean uh, without any um, with eBay then you get your um, you know the more you sell or whatever the more you buy the more you um uh you you can see sliding scale of fees and what have you yeah right oh you're getting yeah, the feedback just, the feedback it, and stuff yeah yeah if you're first time if you're doing it for the first time what what what, what happens there if you're a first time mm -hmm. listener uh, first time listener yeah yeah i, I mean I, for, so uh it's free to list uh that the, it's a 3.5 percent uh selling fee which is significantly lower than eBay and, and uh, comparable competition. And, uh, you, you know, for us, from day one, our, our CEO, David Kalt, uh, you know, has really been focused on making the music buying and selling process on the internet more affordable. And, it, you know, the, the, I think the old trope of the starving artist is, is real in many ways. And, you know, anything you can do to keep a little bit more money in the pocket of the buyer or the seller, I, you know, it's a good thing for them. And, and frankly, you know, it help it helps us um, uh, maintain transaction volume. You know, we really want people to buy and sell and try things. And hey, if that doesn't really work out for you, you know, sell it again and you're only out maybe a couple of bucks. Because of that, we keep the fees low and we keep them really consistent for everybody. You know, the, 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 the person who is selling the old bass guitar in the closet that they're not playing anymore really is on equal footing uh, to some of the largest retailers and, and, and suppliers in the world selling direct. And there's not, there's not a lot of preferential treatment. We do, we do have something called the preferred seller program where after you've sold uh, a couple of items, you know, that there are, there are some additional benefits that we overlay for free as part of the, pro, uh, part of the, the service, but that bar is set at a place where really um, it's attainable by most people. If you're, if you're, you know, buying or selling even a, a relatively modest amount of gear. Excellent. Thank you. I, I wonder if I could bring it back to some more statistical information because uh, sure. I'm really <laughs> so, so say the mini logs doing really well. Um, are there any real surprises if you just sort of gone, wow, I just what a specific cat niche or category that's just suddenly shot up uh, because I mean, at the moment, guitars and that side of it seems to a fairly fallow, uh, certainly from a news point of view, there's not an awful lot of new stuff going on. So where are the hot spots in terms of uh, music technology? Sure, sure. So, you know, I mean, a lot of a lot of the most popular stuff is exactly what you would think. You know, we continue to see modular grow. It's about 30 percent of our market right now and, and continues to grow. And within modular, it's make noise and mutable are, are the clear winners. Uh, you know, everybody, every, I mean, there are several brands doing well, but make noise and mutable, I think have really separated themselves from, from the pack, uh, and just, just continue to do, do great business. Um, you know, on the, on the vintage side of things, you know, that, that's probably where I'm a, I'm more of a vintage synth guy. I'm just lucky enough to be able to, to play in that world. But you know, the, 
the, the, I guess it's kind of like a reverse surprise. I'm surprised that vintage isn't more popular. Uh, having said that, what we see is the Juno 106 just continues to be, you know, the archetype of a vintage synthesizer. Prices continue to rise on it. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's a top, I think it's number, I think it's in the top 20 of products on Reverb to all products across every category. Really? Wow. Uh, which speaks to, yeah, yeah. Uh, which speaks to, I mean, two things. One, it just speaks to how many Juno 106s there are in the world uh, that we can just continue to see con consistent supply and 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 see activity there. Um, uh, the DX7 also continues to be uh, a very popular vintage synthesizer. Uh, prices are pretty steady there again because I think that there, you know, there's even probably an order of magnitude more DX7s in the world than there are Juno 106s, but. Uh, but what what I've been it, surprised surprised, but I've been excited by is um, FM synthesis overall as a as a sub a subtype. Uh, the the Volca FM, the the new Electron uh, Digitone are both doing really 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 well, and you know I think it it speaks to. Uh, I mean FM synthesis isn't any any more straightforward than it was when the DX7 uh, was created, but it feels like these makers, whether, you know, whether it's Korg or Electron, we're starting to figure out how to take FM synthesis, make it a little bit more accessible, a little bit more hands-on. And, and it seems like the market's really responding favorably to that. And so, you know, to me, I'm, I'm going to be excited and I'm interested to see um, if that gives makers more of an incentive to try, um, you know, to kind of bring back some of these more advanced synthesis yeah. or synthesis plus sampling techniques, uh, you know, in the next, in the next wave of new products. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's really, um, it, you know, interesting or exciting. Well, I'll tell you one anecdote. The microcorg continues to be super, super popular. Well, there, there are a hell of a lot of those out there, aren't there? Yeah. Oh my goodness! I mean, it's I, from what I've read, it's the you know the best-selling synthesizer of all time, uh, and really, I, I mean, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that Korg, you know, really kept the the heartbeat of the synth market going there for a while when things were looking rough. You know, the micro Korg was the one synth you could go into a guitar center and tweak tweak some knobs on, um, you know, and it just still continues to be a really great choice for you know if you're in a band and you're primarily a guitar band. And you want to try some synth stuff, but maybe you also want some piano sounds and some kind of bread and butter sounds. It's still just a great, great instrument and it's affordable. It's really, really affordable. So, you know, it's easy, I think, for some of us, you know, more hardcore folks to kind of overlook the micro Korg, but man, it just continues to be a top, you know, top of the charts. Wow, that's interesting. I know, Matt, sorry, I haven't come to you for a little while. Do, do, does some of this chime with? You know, because you're exposed to, uh, you, you're an educator, so you see uh, lots of kids coming in at the early sort of stage of their creative careers. I mean, what the sort of stuff are they looking to buy? Because they probably tell you a little bit about, I've seen this thing on eBay or second hand, what sh should I buy it? You know, what sort of things are they asking you about? Yeah, you know, uh, from the offset, um, uh, you know, one good, decent microphone, um, a decent sound card interface stroke mixer, uh, the usual things and then you get a split you get a split where you've got students who are after the kind of ableton push and i think i remember just in saying that they're quite popular on reverb the pushes push two yep. um so you get that whole whole crew over there who are interested in getting into that world because they see it as this as this other instrument that they can relate to and it fits it integrates with the software and so that that has a mass appeal and then, yeah, you've got the other side, the other spectrum of the students who are into, yeah, collecting the studio gear, the outboard, the the microphones, um, the preamps and that kind of thing. But one thing that they always want to go for, obviously, is software. And they get quite excited by this stuff by um, output, you know, the Exhale oh, yeah, soft okay. synth and all that kind of stuff. They're quite interested in all that sort of world. Um, and getting their hands on those sort of plugins um yeah uad comes up now and then as well uh whether they should get into that world and start buying that kind of equipment as well so um yeah it's quite multifaceted it's quite it's quite interesting actually and um for me i get to see what what they're into and how things are reflecting in their eyes and their desires as music producers 
on a range of backgrounds and, and different music styles that they're making. It's really interesting, actually. Yeah, uh, obviously, they asked me, you know, what are you using, Matt? How, what are you using for your compressors in the box, outside the box? Um, um, so that word of mouth recommendation that, as well is a big deal, I'd imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. And and if I'm if I'm able to show them what I'm actually using by opening my laptop and, and we do tutorials and things like that and and guide them through my my methodology. I suppose part of it though is you're also showing them your your methodology is reflected in your choice of equipment that you're buying. So we could all buy the same microphone or the same outboard or the same modules, but it's your um, approach to using all this equipment, isn't it really? That puts your fun fingerprint on these yeah uh, on your musical output as essentially so i always keep that in mind with them just because something's become fashionable or has been fashionable just think about how you're going to relate to that and how it's going to fit in with you in a meaningful way really if you if you're going to particularly start spending two or three hundred pound as a student you know Okay. Well, I'm going to um, um, stop things here a little bit. I'm just going to have a, a, a isotope competition in case I, because I forgot to mention it at the beginning. So I'm just going to play the uh, the trail for that. So I uh, just uh, uh, want to let you know about Vocal Synth uh, 2, which is Isotope's latest suite of uh, vocal processing plugins. Great new interface, new vocoder, new BioVox module for modeling the human uh, vocal tract more bands in the vocoder, loads more effects, CompuVox as well for glitchy computerized vocals. There's five distinct modules. They also deal with uh, pitch correction and harmonization as well. More presets, more control, more vibe. Uh, there's more effects as well, which you can now read. Or if you want to check out VocalSynth 2 for processing your vocals or any other instruments, but for that matter, uh, do head over to isotope.com forward slash VocalSynth and check that out. And we have a competition uh, winner from last week. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, somebody called El Toro uh, at El Toro the band, which sounds like a pretty serious. Con I, I like that. It's a very strong, <laughs> a strong name. Uh, they say there's way more in five vocal tools, and I'd really like to get my hands on. Uh, and so uh, El Toro the band, if you get in touch, uh, you've won Vocal Synth two, and Isotope will get in touch and let you uh, add it to your account. Um, we've also got another competition this week, and we're looking for the hashtag Vocal Treatment which is one word, the hashtag vocal treatment and the hashtag vocal synth too. And if you tweet that and you do at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc., just by putting that in a tweet, you will be able to enter the competition for next week. And there's plenty more characters, so add some other stuff. We're always interested to hear what else you've got to say. Uh, and I know that Isotope follow the tweets as well. So uh, please do. I want to say thank you very much to Isotope for sponsoring the show uh, with a prize. So the other thing I was interested in, so Justin, do you see, you know, say for instance, there's a big TV performance and somebody's using, I don't know, a Nord stage or, do you know what I mean? Do you see those sort of spikes in sales and, mm -hmm. and, and, and interest rapidly? Does that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah. You know, that, that actually is a, is a really interesting question. And, um, I, I would say, I would say at a high level, um, no, in that there's a little bit of a lag between because our our market is is fundamentally driven by folks who want to sell their gear, and uh, you know what 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 may happen I think is when folks actually see a, a product that they're really excited about and they own it, uh, it may actually encourage them to go plug it back in and play it yeah, some more. Yeah. Um, and so so it's usually fairly it's usually fairly lagging, um, you know, and and I think as further you know even even from our own content you know our reverb uh as as a as a brand you know we really focus on trying to show people how to use this stuff and make a lot of content even even our ability to to really shape the market is somewhat is somewhat limited um which which i really i like that dynamic i think it you know it speaks to a fairly informed uh user base or an informed community where you know they're really they're making their own decisions sort of beyond what uh what they're hearing or seeing uh, so you know there, there usually aren't usually aren't like big runs on um on products but i i can tell you one thing that occurred uh i don't know if you guys caught this but um Oh gosh! Now, I'm, of course, I'm drawing a blank on the uh, the very, very famous singer-songwriter uh, with red hair that wears glasses. Uh, I'm I'm, Ed Sheeran. I'm I'm blanking here for a second. Ed, Ed Sheeran. Sheeran. Yes, thank yeah. you. He uh, last year um, 
when he, I don't know if you guys saw this, but he was using a really, really interesting big foot pedal looper. I think it was on the Grammys. Uh, and it was a, it was a, it was a pretty buzzworthy product. And, uh, it just, it, it just explode. We did a quick article on it and it just exploded. Like everybody on the internet got on the internet the next day and Googled, you know, <laughs> Ed Sheeran looper question mark. Uh, so, so, I mean, there definitely are those moments, you know, those kind of those, those moments where, you know, something will break through in pop culture. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago when, when Stranger Things first launched, we did a, we did a whole breakdown of the sounds of Stranger Things and, you know, that just erupted because it was like, you know, those, those, those kind of classic synth sounds hit the ears of a, of a mainstream audience for the first time in a long time. And there was just this explosion of interest in anything Stranger Things related, you know, you, yeah, any, yeah, yeah. any synth you could play the theme on, you know, it was a good YouTube <laughs> video for a good six months there. Yeah, no, that makes a really big difference. And I mean, I, I get, you know, we know from just, it's we don't get information, we don't get sales data, but often we might do a, a review of something and then we'll be in touch with the manufacturer later and they say, oh, you know, just to ask the question, did you see a spike in sales? And they go, yeah, we sold like 70 units or however many based on just after that. And that's always, always makes us feel kind of good that we're able to uh, advise. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'd love to get kickbacks for all of that, but it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. But but yeah. ultimately, you know, that's the, that's the sort of thing that really, you know, you see quite, you, you can see what sort of effect those things have as well. Um, I suppose totally. the, and sorry. I was going to say, you know, I mean, I think the the nature of synthesizers and electronic instruments, you know, beyond the sort of advertorial aspect of it, you know, I really think that the average buyer can benefit from, you know, a couple of minutes of just breaking down how the instrument works, you know, what the cool features yeah. are, um, yeah. regardless of whether or not it's a sales pitch, because they're different, they're unique, you know, each of these instruments, part of the fun of it is they each have their own uh you know sort of philosophy and way that you're going to use it which is a little bit distinct from guitar it, you, you know i mean there's there's a lot there's you know every guitar is different every guitar is is a beautiful instrument but you don't need to spend as much time on a per instrument basis explaining how a guitar works in our world especially as you know these instruments become you know sort of a new wave of of complexity it's worth taking the time to break down how they work and i think that you know you nick not to not to be gratuitous, but you know I've I've been watching your stuff for years, learning you know independent of whether or not I'm going to buy the piece of gear, just learning more about the instrument you know really helps me make informed decisions. So I, I definitely agree. I mean you know it it's a uh, you can definitely you can definitely inspire folks in the right direction. Um, and you know with us we're not we, we're not an advertising business. We don't make any money off of that. You know we only make money when when something sells on Reverb. So it kind of frees us up just to make the kind of content that's really you know educational first I think and then uh you know sort of sales pitch second third or never uh in the content itself. Yeah. Absolutely, because you do make a lot of your own uh, uh, video content as well. I've I've seen quite a bunch of that. So um, I think what we might do is move on to one of the uh, topics that we got lined up. I'm sure there will be other snippets of reverb-based information that we can drop in as we go on because it's quite an interesting. One. So this was uh, a video that's just been put out by um, uh, Novation, and it's to do with the kind of history of the launch pad and the whole kind of concept of the light show and how how it really became big you know because my uh, music upbringing was was pretty conventional um i started piano lessons there's no real launch pad action in this bit but they talked to emphasonic they talked to i'm trying to remember all the people who are in it now uh nev and uh, there's a french guy as well who was one of the first people to kind of have a a, a launch pad style grid video sample cut up video come up and go big on youtube if i fast forward it a bit we'll probably be able to yeah here we go featuring that's where i should have started the video this really isn't it these guys. Madion, I think he was the first one. But it's just a really interesting approach. And, and I, I was just looking, because I wrote an article based around this. And so some facts about the Launchpad. Launchpad, obviously, it kind of came out of the whole world of the Monomy, which was, or Monome, I don't know how you provide it, which was the first commercially available, shall we say, grid-based controller, 64 pads. And then uh, uh, Novation kind of went with that and made it more mass-produced. Ma uh, mass 
And you know the 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 uh, Manion guy, he posted um, it was pop culture, I think it was, which was cut ups of loads of his favourite tunes, and it was kind of really advanced finger drum. Forty five million views, and then M- Masonic did uh, Weaponized or Weapon Weaponizer, I think it was, and that's done about forty five million views, and they blew up enormously. And so those things have really sold and influenced a whole generation. I mean, now everybody's doing it. It's not an exclusive Novation thing, but I think they were a sort of one of the big enablers for this kind of grid technology to come to to into the hands of the masses and i think you know that's the thing that's that's quite interesting i th- i mentioned in the article as well that uh uh, in 2005, late 2015, early 2016, I think I went up to a Novation for some whatever reason, and they've got a plaque which says 300,000 units sold of the launch pad, and that is a very great deal of them. I, I'm, I'll come to you first, Matt. Do you do you find that there's are there are there a whole layer of musicians who, uh, and people and producers who, who work? purely from a grid-based uh, interface that you're dealing with? And do you actually have modules to encourage them to get the most out of that stuff? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. I think I've, I've probably banged on about this enough in, in previous Sonic talks, you know, where I've talked about some some people just do not get yeah, on with don't the, dig the keyboard, right. keyboard and, and that kind of thing, you know. Um, and some might have tried a MIDI guitar, but as you probably used one before the latency and that kind of thing so um the yeah the push controllers and this grid based way of working definitely appeals to a lot of students um it appealed to me i remember when the launch pad came out i i was just kind of really drawn to its simplicity the layout the integration into the software um the ability to program it to do specific things um, you know, that that one button there could trigger multiple things, whether it be an effect or a loop. Um, I, yeah, it was just like, this is great. Fits in your bag, USB powered. And then it just went from there, really, didn't it? Um, we, we, we do have specific modules on the course that I run at BIM for um, this kind of compute music performance and production. I do one actually called Compute Music Performance, where students actually create a track and then they have to look at how they would play that live on stage mm, that's an interesting explore, exercise uh, yeah we explore a whole range of midi controllers from um you know the magic leap um controllers yep. that you read leap motion um leap motion thank you um we use yeah normal midi controllers ableton push or the akai kind of mp uh cave 40s that kind of thing and we you know we weigh up the pros and cons over do you want a slider for this or do you need a dial for it there's some things you can do quicker with a touch of a button obviously rather than than a dial um you can do faders can be really good because you can switch them really quickly and generally we're, we're hardly ever talking about using a keyboard other than you might use you might use the traditional keys maybe to launch um parts in of the song rather than actually playing notes and using the keyboard that way because if you if you look at the keyboard layout you know c1 could be part one of a song and then uh, yeah, d could then be part two and it's a very easy layout and way to work your way through that song when you're playing live um and then we also look at actually how you can then work with live instruments incorporate that we look at latency of course and collaborating with people vocalists and that kind of thing it's really really in- interesting and it's it's really fun to see what they do and what what they get up to they do everything from taking some like an sh101 and shoving it through a load of distorted guitar pedals and making a big wall of sound and just pumping that into a computer and side chaining it um and then you know cutting that up using launch pads or push controllers um, stuttering and effects max for live stuff then comes in so they create their own bespoke plugins and interfaces for oh, right. for creating sounds it, you know it, it goes on and on and on as soon as you open up that world of computer music performance um it, yeah there's so so many different opportunities and paths to go down now it's it's great it's really good fun isn't it yeah, definitely. Uh, Gaz, I think maybe the launch pad was mm. really tied. It really tied in with the rise of Ableton Live, didn't it? Because that was the the thing about it. The, I mean, yes, it's a dedicated MIDI controller, but it was more out of the box designed to really in, to integrate with Ableton itself. You know, the the, the grid for the grid and that yes. side of things, right? Yeah, 
Absolutely. And there was, of course, the Akai APC-40, which I think came out before the first launch pad. Um, ah, okay. But, yep. you know, it was a much bigger thing uh, with lots more. And I think one of the reasons why the launch pad was so successful was that it was super affordable, super slim, as you know, as, as, as Matt said as well, you know, really easy to sort of lug around. And that, you know, the APC-40 was quite a bulky thing, you know, good thing. Mm-hmm. But what I think also is something really crucial to remember, though, is that, like, um, you know, like MPC skills, uh, you know, and Jay Diller, you know, that kind of thing has become mm-hmm. almost for a newer generation, a bit like Guitar Heroes were previously, yeah. you know, yeah, for, yeah, especially true. for super skills, like, you know, like really, really, really brilliant. Um, and, you know, and obviously on like the machine platforms, uh, and people like Jeremy Ellis and, um, Oh, you know, it's amazing. But that whole kind of way to really be kind of quite showy in what you do, you know, which is very different from a laptop, you know, a laptop, boring, boring, boring. So it was a way to kind of, you know, to make a jazzier kind of laptop based performance, you know, without touching the laptop. So, uh, but I think that kind of skills to pay the bills kind of vibe, you know, that really kind of super duper yeah, yeah, yeah. boy kind of, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I, I think that they kind of got a lot of that stuff as well you know yeah which i think and like i got one you know the launch pad pro with it's a orange <laughs> background uh is a really cool product as well this is like i think is the most recent evolution of the novation launch pad but um it's always worth pointing this out though, because people sometimes forget that this thing can be used standalone and aha this is an interesting topic isn't it nick look oh uh, yeah breakout the- on mini jack midi so you can use it as a standalone thing and you can use that clever notes mode stuff and um you know where it just displays keys and scales uh yeah. as as um whatever you want and um so that's kind of a pretty cool it's got aftertouch poly aftertouch on it as well yeah well i mean that, that that's quite Not, key because, how, yeah. that is quite key mm. because the uh right. the other thing the other aspect of this was the the fact that you can actually you know if you get clever with it you can program your own light show stuff so and that's all the other side of yeah. things that people are doing oh, which yeah as well, and so. like this but we must mention though that big announcement the midi announcement as well at some point nick maybe after this topic about the standardization of, of the, the, mini yeah, the midi the mini, midi. midi jet, which is is a big deal and it's, sadly sadly for novation it's not their standard sadly for artoria they backed the wrong horse. I was oh, going no. for them. But Betamax. No. <laughs> yeah, it is. And Cog, who sort of steadfastly <laughs> stuck with their wiring of one, you know. So now what do these do? Do they have to just, because MIDI works by standardization. So by having, I, I would have been really angry. I've been well, really no, it doesn't, angry it doesn't, no, this. Hold on, hold on. It doesn't matter because if you're using the Novation one, you still get the right MIDI coming yeah. out. It's not like you, it won't oh, it work does, anymore. What, what, no, 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 absolutely not. But I'm talking going forward, though, just this idea that, you know, like in years to come, you find you pick up a piece of equipment and you go to plug it in and it doesn't work because it was, uh, you know, you, you can get adapters and things to switch it yeah. around. But just what anyway, we need, eh? That was more just of those. A, no, that's, <laughs> more, a, that, that's clag more, more clag dust. I, I don't know. Um, um, so, uh, Justin, so do, do these have a fairly consistent sort of sale value? You know, uh, do you see a lot of the sort of Novation launch pad? family moving around on uh Reba. yeah oh for sure yeah i mean the grid controllers just as a as a subcategory uh just continue to grow in popularity right in lockstep with i think their adoption you know across more and more musical styles you know and just just to kind of recap you know everything just from basic li- clip launching um up to a lot more uh, virtuosic performances. We had a we had a fantastic artist named Jonathan Stein in um, last year on the push, and he just ripped. I, I don't even know how else to say it. You know, I mean, he it was it was just a virtuosic grid based performance. Uh, and I think as these as these devices become more expressive, um, and you know, and and the price points continue to to drive that expressiveness at, to 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 lower or to to, to a wider audience. You know, you're gonna see. I love. I, I think that. I think that uh, it was said exactly right. You know, it's the sort of guitar. 21st century guitar hero is the grid hero. I really think mm-hmm. that the grid is the instrument of the 21st century, and I, I think that Ableton deserves a lot of credit for that. But it, it feels like we've sort of 
you know, Ableton said, hey, let's think about things non-linearly. And then mm. Novation and, and some of these hardware makers said, okay, let's just think about this as a grid, as an interface. What can you do with a grid? And it's much more approachable, I think, for a lot of folks who, again, you know, you see black and white keys and you think, nope, uh -uh, I don't know how to play piano. Mm -hmm. But you see a grid of buttons, you say, I don't know what that does. I'm just going to start pushing buttons. And it might <laughs> trigger some beats. It might play a note, you know, and that sort of nonlinearity yeah. of it all, I think, draws people in. And yeah, I mean, we, we continue to see uh you know they're, they're holding their price points like it's a, such a good thing to buy used you know you can save some bucks on it they're pretty durable uh and it's a really cool thing just to add especially if you're if you're a laptop producer and i'm not trying to sell anything but just from my perspective if you're a laptop producer and you're proficient inside of your daw you're proficient inside of ableton it is it is such a breath of fresh air and a game changer to to even plug in one controller or one device into your computer and start going more hands-on and i really think for a lot of people the grid controller is the right first step out of the box back into the world of physical interfaces um yeah and it just continues to be uh, uh the, i think really the, the meta trend that we're seeing across the kind of midi controller controller mm. uh category is the grid is it, it, I, we were talking a little bit at sort of pre-show i mean uh, you were saying that the push two is actually or the push stuff is doing well i mean in comparison is push is push actually doing better in terms of volume you know uh, than than the the innovation stuff. I'm not sure how you measure that. Yeah. Particularly. Yeah. No. From a volume perspective, the launch pads do better. I mean, it's just a price point perspective. Um, and I think as they've you know as they've expanded that line, there's the the mini and there's the pro. Uh, yeah, you know, they've sure. really figured out I think how to hit a couple different segments. Uh, the push is a bigger investment. Uh, you know, I I think uh, for for a lot of folks, like you, you know, you kind of need to make the decision. Like I'm all in on Ableton. Uh, to really make to buy the push, but the thing with the push is that it holds its value, which is why it why it's so popular. When we you know when we look at sort of top products overall, Launchpad uh, is doing higher volume, but because the push used holds its value so well, uh, it ends up at the top of the charts. But I mean, really, we st we even the launch key, the Novation, you know, the keyboard, the Novation keyboard with just yeah. like two rows of grid I think, buttons, yeah, we got one even of that does really well. That's interesting. Hmm. I think it's, it's, it's. I think the thing that the grid itself is a great idea. I think the problem I have mm. with it is it's that combination. That's, I've always liked the look of the APC forty and the APC forty Mark II, just because you've got so much more hands on, and you see a lot of those uh, people like uh, Loopers, uh, like Claudio, uh, Claudio, and uh, various other people who are using that as the heart of their center because they've got push, but they've also got that for for with all the rotary encoders. It really makes a big difference for that additional mm -hmm. hands on because when you're playing live, that, you need to reach for something, don't you? Sorry, guess. Yeah, well, with the don't forget that with the launch pad, they they did in, innovate with that amazing thing where you can kind of go, it, you put it into volume mode, and oh, then yeah, you and then hit. You, and if you, and depending on how hard you hit it, you can control how fast you make the fader move. So if you want it to mute straight away, just a really hard tap of it will make it just go. But like a slow tap will make it slowly fade. And I mean that is something I haven't really seen replicated anywhere else, and is a really cool function actually. Uh, you can do that across all the parameters. And it's quite fun if you've got lots of macro set up and just 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 sort of punch away kind of r randomly. Um, mm. So you know it's kind of interesting, isn't it, how they develop that grid into you know these are this is a new area of of performance i suppose isn't it something that yeah. we wouldn't have uh you know envisaged years ago and that's right yeah, I, I, and the I'm launch pad is a i'm still not part. not totally grid gridded up but it definitely is a uh, useful some things um um i think we should probably try and move on to another topic while we've got the uh we've got the momentum that uh, this one was interesting this is uh, a guy called tony longworth who's just done the soundtrack for this uh motion picture release purely on core gadget on ios uh we posted an article on it and all the cues are listed and it just it was what was fascinating about this is he was very specific it was only using gadget it's, like, it's a kind of horror thriller action film Obviously, uh, it's quite dark in places, but just the very fact of that is uh, a, a, quite an impressive thing. And, you know, I know sometimes we get criticised for not put, um, doing enough iOS, sort of maybe outside of the podcast. I mean, either you talk about it too much or not enough. It's really hard to tell, you know, which one is the, the correct answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I don't know, Gaz, I know you're a big fan mm. of uh, Gadget. Are you surprised at this or is yeah. this... Uh, yeah. No, not not at all. Well, the only thing that's a surprise that it's taken this long, really, because, you know, <laughs> Gadget is a, an incredible piece of software and the way that it's expanded over the years as well um, is amazing. And, I mean, you know, when they've brought out things like the Wave Station... Um, oh, yeah, the additional and then that instruments. Becomes you know, and that's a very clever sort of ecosystem that Korg have pioneered in the iOS world. You know, you buy like a full standalone thing like the Wave Station, and then it appears as some randomly named world city in Gadget. Uh, I don't think <laughs> I have no idea what the naming is about. That uh, Isn't you know, it, why it, certain it, genres of some sort of genre, like Berlin School and. Mm. Uh, I, I think sure. there's a few things like that, but a lot it gets really weird. I mean, well, actually, like because there is like a PCM sort of player thing, and it's called Glasgow. <laughs> so, like, I don't know, working man's, working man's club in Glasgow, perhaps. Yeah, but, yeah. Right, yeah, I'm with it. I can see how that how that works actually. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, Gadget is a really amazing piece of software. The the way that automation works is absolutely super slick and the interface is really, really good. And of course, you can do something this again, something people forget about. You can export your project out of Gadget on the iOS into an Ableton Live format. And it's then, bing, you've got a full session view uh, uh, version uh, in Ableton Live with everything rendered as audio files. I'm not sure if you can do it. I wonder it if that's what he did. Using, ah, well, yeah. But he, you know, uh, but even still, you could do it totally in in the iPad. There's enough of the automation, and there's some decent effects, and uh, you know, Korg know how to make things sound good. So that's why I mean, this this is a perfectly valid way of working. And in fact, you know, a pair of headphones, gadget, maybe a little MIDI controller, but maybe not a MIDI, MIDI controller, or maybe done with the you know step sequencing. In fact, the step sequencer is so fluid and easy to use. They kind of got it right from the very first release of gadget the, mm. the 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 sort of um the piano roll editor that that's always been very intuitive some parts maybe not so intuitive in gadget but you you know when you figure it out but yeah great but of course as i say as a sort of uh, as a way of being able to play all your kind of legendary old korg keyboards uh, and yeah so you just as light really as it was to sound right uh, i'd just like to point out like, lady mm, aptitude uh scored a version of the sonic soul theme tune using core gadget only uh hopefully well, i'll put the link to that mm. in the show notes if i remember um matt i, I, I don't know mm. whether or not you in hype i mean you know you're that i can see behind you that you're there's not a lot of ipads there but there's a lot of modular stuff i mean do you <laughs> do, I suppose that the, the the concept of the technical limitation is a good one, and I guess the the guy could probably that means he could be working on his stuff on the bus home, uh, on holiday, in bed, you know, all of those things. Yeah. Whereas for the rest of us, we have to sort of be at the studio or at an instrument that will give us some sort of possibility of working those ideas out, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I think it's really interesting what's going on here, and it's it's potentially a sign of the times and things to come as as the iPad will develop. And as the integration of the apps will develop, um, we'll look back maybe 10 years time and go, do you remember when that guy did that soundtrack? He was the first to do it maybe on an iPad and that that was it. And it might become a lot more commonplace. Um, yeah, I really think it's a, a sign of times. And I, I think it sounds great as well. I had listened to it and I thought, you know, if I was sat watching this at home, I wouldn't be sat there going, mm, this, this isn't quite right. And it's, it sounds a bit off you know I, I i really like it the use of the effects is really good the composition's really interesting as well um but I, yeah i i do still use ipads um mainly for midi note generation so i will i'll plug it into something like the Hermod, which is a usb interface um eight channel sequencer module and that just allows me to kick midi out um midi to cv conversion and I'll use all sorts of different apps on on the iPad to do that. That's that's great for me. There's some really interesting stuff. Any way of generating MIDI in really interesting ways, I'm big into. And there's loads of great apps to do that. That's one of the reasons why I got the Chord Bot as well. Um, it's just into that straight away. Really, really right. interesting. Right, cool. Uh, Justin, I mean, I guess that the, the iOS ecosphere, um, apart from maybe people selling used iPads, it's one that you guys don't really have much of a piece of. 
Um, so it's hard for you to have any kind of sales measurement data on that kind of stuff. Or maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, so w within our um, within our digital um, category on Reverb, we do list um, some apps that are that are free, primarily just for our users to to kind of give them a. a uh, an entry point into the world of iOS uh, music making, and and it's you know it just continues to grow. I mean, I think you know even just looking at our our mobile app, the Reverb mobile app, you know we we we're we're just about at that point where the majority of our uh, traffic and the, and our community is accessing our our experience on mobile. Um, you know, so I mean, the, the 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 trend there, I think, is 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 totally clear. You know, to me, mobile music making is is the future. Um, and I, just for what it's worth, I love Gadget. I think that they nailed it. And I I think that uh, Gaz's point about, you know, it seems like a, it, it's a deceptively tricky problem. I think to design a touch based piano roll, and I I feel like I've tried just about all of them. And and the only other one that really I, I don't know this is this might be a shot in the dark, but I loved the nano studio app. It was just a single developer. Oh yeah. I remember and that. He just, he just Fantastic. nailed the piano roll. I, it just, it was just intuitive. Yeah, it it just brilliant. worked like you right. would think if you were going to touch yeah. notes. And I feel like gadgets yeah. really, gadget really, you know, mm. picked up some of those UX patterns that, that really worked. I'm not saying that they were influenced by that, but you know, they kind of arrived at similar conclusions and, you know, especially with, with, um, Apple supporting audio unit format now in iOS. You know, you're seeing plugin makers recompiling their software for mobile. I, I just, I think, I think we're going to look back a couple years from now and say, "Yep, mm -hmm. that was the sea change. That was the turning point." And you know, I think it's a good thing. I mean, the more people in my, from my perspective, the more people making music in the world, the better, the better off the world will be. You know, well, that's a uh, yeah, that's a valid <laughs> point as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the more, the better. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because we're going to get to the point where we got these tiny little, very powerful computing devices with sort of massive <laughs> controllers <laughs> that we're using to input mm -hmm. and, and perform with. And yeah. It's just it's curious. So, there, one other little thing we forgot to mention, though, you see, just that Gadget runs on the iPhone as well. And the thing called the Gadget Cloud kind of synchronizes across devices. I'm assuming that does to the computer version as well. That's cool. um, uh, but the gadget, you know, so so that's the thing as well, isn't it? You know, it could go with you, like on the phone. So that's mm. uh, yeah. Well, they're not the first you know. to do that. The reason do that? No, with, of course uh, they're not. The, the, no, so, no, but maybe no. their integration is yeah. is just a better yeah. better approach. But yeah, there's also there is that thing as well. The Ali, what's it called? Ali Hooper. I've never used it actually, yeah. but um, yeah. that's built in. So that's a whole community of um, of you know, there's a whole ecosystem there isn't there of people sharing music and sharing oh, yeah, parts true. and putting elements in so you know so they've embraced a, a, like a social media aspect into it as well i mean you don't need to go there because i guess that would uh, <laughs> send shivers of fear to a lot of people but, but it's um what... But it, it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, because I mean, looking at it, I mean, Korg are one of the. I mean, I, I, I'm hesitating to kind of uh, make any other uh, uh, judgments on this, but aren't they kind of one of the only companies that have got the multiple threads of you know the, just the software, j just the hardware, uh, kind of right? You know, they've they've integrated, they've, yeah. they've done great products in both categories. Um, yeah, I think they're the only company who's successfully got the iOS thing right out of the big ones. You know, Roland do um support apps and they've had dabbled in other things but n not anything quite as su succinct and they and the co the core conversions of the iOS, uh, iOS of the as I mentioned about the wave station they're they're not just straight recreations they tend to sort of take that and then open it out it, and like the wave station one is a really interesting one the way it allows you to get into the nitty-gritty of wave sequencing uh, which would have probably been horrid <laughs> on the original yeah, one yeah yeah, yeah. um but so actually because so it's quite an interesting thing so rather than being really purist in their return to their classic sense they've kind of actually used the format to expand on so you know so kudos to them in that way really as well to be fair yeah yeah absolutely absolutely Right, it's, it's a workflow thing at, at the end of the day. Um, I just can't see a lot of people that I know, and I, I still write for TV and adverts, going out and, and just doing this on an iPad and switching it up right away. Um, there's particular tools that we all use, go-to plugins and... Um, well, that um, makes certain know, jobs easier. Yeah, got. exactly, yeah. 
absolutely it's a workflow thing and these things just take time as, as a tide of new composers and producers come in who will start embracing this technology a little bit more because you know an ipad and to buy the, the core gadget um is far cheaper than going out and and getting a mac and loading it up with a load of contact instruments perhaps and all that kind of thing so accessibility for the new composers will drive forward um this new wave of of composition i suppose and, and work ethic yeah i suppose that's the thing i mean as you become i mean uh, tony longworth is actually uh, quite he's been doing it for 25 years so he's kind of gone around it in a slightly different way but i mean somebody okay. who's starting off is like well this is all i can afford this is the limitations i'm working with yeah. you know as you as you find that you've got to do more and more of this kind of thing you know you tend to buy things that you think will make your job easier and give you more yeah. time on the job rather than figuring out how to do the job i suppose yeah if that makes that's sense. right and and i know i've got this that the hardware sat behind me and i do stuff with adverts and i just i will just use the modular and i'll record stuff down but i'll make notes and if if i need to do retakes or change timbre of stuff i can do that i can i can patch something up pretty quick and get back and record that down or, or make edits within the box um so you know that's that's how i work i'm just pretty quick at doing that and it's a preference to, to just quickly repatch up a few oscillators get that sound back re-record the passage down and 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 resend it off that just for me that is so quick compared to if i was to get an ipad load up the app and that wouldn't be so quick for me so right no, what works for you again you know exactly whatever works for you um and we're nearly at the end i did want to just get this in quickly because it's just such a bonkers uh, uh piece this was uh, something i found uh, this is where the facebook uh, suggestion algorithm actually did do something useful for me it doesn't often um but this was the 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 33 photographs of the Pink Floyd concert in, in Venice on a massive floating stage in uh, 1989. This was vintage, vintag.es, so vintages, I suppose. And th looking at the the kind of this concept, so basically what they did is they, by all accounts, and this is allegedly in all of those sort of disclaimers, they managed to uh, obviously the the person in in charge or high up in the Venetian council was a Floyd fan. So they managed to basically bribe their way into getting this massive floating stage, create this ridiculous 250,000 people, they reckon, showed up for this gig. There was no provision for sort of toilets or, or catering or accommodation. And they just plonked this massive stage in front of the um, San Marco and did a gig. And it was televised to 20 million people, 100 million people, they reckoned it was. And that's in 1989. So that's a lot of people. And it just seemed to me as like, you know, that there are the pictures of the aftermath, which are just sort of shocking. 300 mm. tons of rubbish, you know, people yeah. climbing up uh, listed buildings and weeing in the court. I mean, look, that is just chaos. But they did, they managed to somehow pull off. And I just thought, well, that's not something that you're going to be able to get uh, happening very often in life. Um I don't remember anything about this because I was never really a Pink Floyd fan, so I kind of I can't I I can't quite fathom it. I know there are lots of I was talking to Rich Hilton about this because he said you know they've Sheik have done floating gigs and they've done town hall free gigs and stuff, but all of that stuff is very well managed now. You can't just sort of turn up and do something on that mm. scale anymore. I know Gaz, I know uh, you are a Pink Floyd fan or have been I'd certainly. So I'm guessing did, did yeah. you know about this one? Yeah, don't you? Know, I mean, I'm surprised you forgot about it. It was sort of so televised no i just the remember day. the wall uh, yeah <laughs> um and i was just thinking about like that concert how all those people you know were singing along to certain songs and then just kind of slightly irritated whilst all the stuff off momentary lapse of reason was going on because all these horrible tunes and then get back <laughs> into it again when the other songs come on <laughs> um but yeah, oh, it was great fun. I remember this. No, I remember it well. It was, um, oh. I, can't, I just can't imagine it ever happening again. I mean, it just seems like oh, it's well for free, you know. No, for free. Well, yeah. Oh, hold on. Can, uh, Matt, ha Matt I, has a. I can think of one thing that's happened since I was thinking about this because you're right. You could never think of anything happening like that again. It wasn't quite in the water, but it was close. But do you remember Fat Boy Slim played on Brighton Seafront to a free concert? and that's right it you know there was nothing it was the same sort of thing there was there was a handful of police there was no toilets and then there were people literally standing in the sea as the tide was coming in you know the, the the space that all these people had got smaller and smaller 
and it was absolute chaos. And you just think, yeah, nothing like that surely could happen again. That did happen, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure now it's it, that wouldn't happen again. No way. No, I, I can't imagine. I remember it playing it at at the Hlantrisant Free Festival in 1996, <laughs> I think it was. And like, uh, I think two and a half thousand people were estimated to come and 25,000 people came. And, uh, and the security was uh, the Hells Angels <laughs> doing the security, the berserkers, <laughs> who were uh, sort of, I'm quite pleased to say they've actually disbanded now because they were a, quite naughty um the uh but yeah and it kicked off we were playing a gig a massive fight kicked off as well it was like uh, i always remember seeing this guy he had his arm in plaster he's just mashing it into someone else's head like with a prayer. um yeah loads of arrests four or five people went off in an ambulance oh my god it was uh whew. yeah but i mean that i mean and that was complete chaos because that was a free that was a i mean i was thinking when it went it reminded me when i read about this within the show notes i remind I remembered about that that Flantricent thing really. I mean it's gone down in Flantricent legend now. <laughs> but um yeah, you know, free. People caught wind of it, just lovely day, just you know, just everyone. I suppose we get the and, 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 and book and booking the right the power of the brand and stuff. I don't know, Justin. I mean imagine uh, uh do, they you don't do tickets, do you, on uh, on reverb? I suppose free tickets wouldn't make any sense, but do... No, no no tickets. Uh no, I mean, I was gonna, I was just gonna say, you know, at a totally different level, um, I'm, I'm active here in the Chicago scene, and and you know, the conversations, at least at the local level these days, are are all about how do we do non-traditional gigs? How do we, you know, if we are playing that venue, how do we incorporate lighting? Or how, you know, it just seems like it, even even at the local Thursday night level, folks are really trying to push push the envelope of what live performance can be there's a there's a band out of detroit called uh, adult that uh just just played uh played their album release show in an airport hangar uh and you know and and it, it was i don't know i don't know how the acoustics were in that airport hangar but you know they Not were able to really imagine. generate <laughs> yeah right uh they were able to generate some really interesting buzz and 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 some attention for themselves by purposefully you know, playing with the venue. Uh, there's a band here in, in Chicago called Hyde that uh, did a series of kind of pop-up gigs in uh, in cemeteries uh, of all places. Uh, so, you know, I mean, the, like, I, I feel like, you know, you know, it's certainly no Pink Floyd, but uh, it really feels like, you know, the, uh, the pushing of the envelope in terms of what the live performance is, where it is, um, what the experience is like, just continues to innovate. Do you think there's some aspect of it? Because, I mean... It's like also a compensation for, I don't know, either the technical nature of the music where, I mean, Pink Floyd aren't, I, I don't remember them being renowned as person, you know, individual show people, but the show itself was always on a grand scale. And obviously with, with some music which is requires, you know, I don't know, laptop use or whatever, where the focus is on the performance and you can't really kind of project your personal performance you know you you try and compensate by putting on more of a show and more of a spectacle to to to, to make that into something so we're seeing more of that and also the technology enables it to be able to be done without having to have a lighting truck and 15 lighting guys and whatever you could mm -hmm. like like you say you could run it off i mean you were saying justin that you run you run the dmx lights off your ableton live show f from from your computer while you're doing the uh, the clip launching and all that as well yeah, I mean, I, just just to go back to the point you just said, I, you know, th there is having played in rock bands and in, you know the sort of built-in entertainment value of seeing, you know, four or five people all playing together. You, you just you just lose it. You know, you, it 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 is not as exciting when you're you when you've got a laptop and a couple of guys or gals up on stage. And so from day one, I, you know, I pushed as hard as like I I used an Octatrack for a long time, and finally I was like, you know, if I'm gonna use a laptop, I'm gonna maximize what I can get out of this and went down the rabbit hole of max for live and DMX converters and everything. And you have to do something, you know, you have to, you have to do something to mm -hmm. differentiate and to add scale and, and drama to, to what is otherwise a fairly static performance. And, it, you know, I think that the synthesizer and electronic music folks are, 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 pretty plugged into that at this point uh it's, uh, every every local synth show i go to somebody's got a strobe light or a fog machine or something but what's been interesting to me is 
there's actually a really great hardcore band here. Uh, one of the one of our employees plays in it, and uh, and he came to me, and and even he was like, you know, I wanna I wanna add lights to our to our setup, and this is you know this is a pretty traditional hardcore band, and we we were actually were able to put together a pretty cool foot controller based rig uh, based on some of the new products that uh, I believe it's Ch Chauvet uh, is how you, you pronounce it, but you know even the even the lighting companies are starting to get hipper to how do we make it so that a bass player could turn on some strobe lights during the chorus of their of their song and uh and it's just it works you know i'm i'm pretty sure that a couple of years from now everyone's going to have lighting rigs and we're all going to be debating what the next innovation is but the technology is becoming more accessible it's more affordable you know you can buy the stuff used that's not a reverb plug it's just true you know you can buy the stuff used and and <laughs> and save some bucks there and and you know, and you, next thing you know, you've got a dramatically more interesting live performance yeah. uh, by just plugging in some lights. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think that's so Very important, true. you know, for those of us who are on stage with just a laptop or or even just a you know a small modular system, having that visual aesthetic is so important. Having your your logo up there just before the start of the stage with your socials on and that kind of thing. Um, we use Resolume Avenue. We, we load a load of uh, clips into that, which we can launch in real time from MIDI controllers. Some of it's pre-sequenced, but some of it we can integrate with. And then on top of that, there's the layer where you can obviously change color and hues and saturation and add delay effects on the visuals and make it all really trippy. Um, yeah, again, that's that's just a whole other layer. And I think it's so important to have that out there as for those of us who are producer performers, definitely. Yeah, totally with you on that one, Justin. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I think I, I, I'm familiar with Rizalium, but, you know, even just, just to riff on what you just said, the day I figured out that I can draw automation curves for my RGB values for my DMX <laughs> lights, it was like, it was just a whole new world. I, I realized, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm mm -hmm. doing like color synthesis and sequencing in real time. <laughs> wow, what, I don't even know what that means, but I'm, I'm, I'm going deep into it. It's just, yeah. you know, for... For the, mm. there's a certain mindset I think where, y you know, you, you, there are never too many knobs. Uh, you, you know, I'm already looking at new DMX lights with, with you know, the the 20 channel version now up from my seven channel version. It's just another mode of creativity, and I think that, y you know, for the artists and the painters and the visually minded of the world to be thinking mm -hmm. about sequencing, whether it's whether it's video clips like what you're doing, or, or you know, mine's a little more basic, just kind of. You know, lights and light and color but it's just it's just a whole other art form that is yeah. just an endlessly well, fascinating and exciting thing to go down yeah, yeah. that it as super booth that's super booth this year uh, bernard uh but uh, reisinger is it bernard did an amazing show with lasers that were coming that was uh it was a laser generator coming from his euro rack so as he whatever he was doing on the rack was the laser was kind of uh interpreting uh we, did you catch that nick i didn't know did i'd gone home i was knackered i just couldn't couldn't oh, spot yeah i know really you and andy amazing. went to see it yeah oh, no yeah. there's, well, but, there's I mean, so no, much just, you could just do just to back up what you're saying really really exciting i'd just like to point out that in the chat room that uh, sinister goatfish just put this rather great quote which is all you need is a base and a sock <laughs> which is the uh, i think in reference <laughs> to red hot chili papers <laughs> flea which i think yeah. it sort of brings it back hang down on, to the kind on. of rock and roll aspect I, I've got I've got a base here. Hang on, let me just look around. No, for hold on. You're fine, Jack. Yeah, you're not, it's no, no problem. You're fine. No <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you ever so much, everybody, for joining. Because it's been great fun, uh, and thank you, Justin, for coming on and uh, answering answering questions and uh, writing up the stats. It'd be great to have you again at some point in the future when we can we can find another excuse to shoehorn some more reverb statistics into the show. Been a pleasure. I hope uh, I hope you now go out and uh, all your all your uh, uh, co-workers have been watching you and you get uh, bought a drink or something for your first, first appearance on the show they'll, they'll they'll probably critique my my performance more than anything but uh thank you very much i really appreciate it. like i said I've, I've been a fan just personally for a long time i love what you guys are doing i love that you are really a hub for the community you know internationally and uh we're just uh we're just excited to be a part of it man excellent well thanks for coming on it's been a pleasure and of course you can find everything to do with that at reverb.com matthew hodson also thank you for joining us too uh it's lovely to thanks have you as me. ever um what are you on to yeah. now have you got an are you doing another live show uh i'm not doing one after this no i'm i'm finished plugging in all this equipment 
just dining out a few things like i said i put this mac in and sound cards just getting that ready just so i can crack on with uh finishing my ep basically that's ah, yes that's me basically but thanks very much for having me and it's been great chatting to everyone in the chat room again um yeah pleasure as usual thanks nick you're welcome and also Gaz thanks for joining us too I think we're going to come over to Bristol and see you tomorrow so uh, we'll we'll, we'll see you in person soon yeah, thank you for joining great. us thanks yeah nice and nice to meet you Justin see you Matt wicked cheers nice, we'll, do our, we'll, we'll do our famous uh, celebrity squares <laughs> oh, yeah. wave goodbye so uh, thanks very much oh, that was cool. it for the, oh actually before I do that now I've just got to I, I should oh. actually just do the isotope competition one more time uh, if you want to win a copy of isotope's vocal synth 2 we're looking for the hashtag vocal treatment as one word and the hashtag vocal synth 2 uh, at Sonic state and at isotope inc that's the hashtag vocal treatment one word and the hashtag vocal synth 2 the number 2 to at Sonic state and at isotope inc uh, that's it for this week thank you very much for watching we'll see you all again next time take care